Luke really knows his name, we're talking about that, but even more so, we know that uh, we can rest assured because God knows us even better. He knows every hair on our head. So, all right, turn with me, if you would, to the book of Esther, and we're going to uh, we're going to eventually kind of get into Esther chapter one. Uh, but in sections today, I won't be reading the whole text as I normally do it in one stretch. So, this morning we turn to Esther. It's one of the most unusual books in what we call the canon of Scripture. The first chapter is where we're going to focus, but the story of Esther is really about empires. And so that's where it starts, in the capital city of a vast pagan empire. It's a story about invisible, an invisible collision of rival empires, and the god who can take down kings armed with nothing but an old man and a young girl, without his name even ever showing up in the book. Now this is a familiar story to many, but before we go into the story this morning again, I want to enter in with a couple of key themes. So here is some preparatory work that I did this week in regards to human empires, which I think is vital, especially where we find ourselves as a nation, as an empire, if you will, uh, a country that is really at the crossroads in many ways. So a little history. So take it for what you will. But every empire over time has given inevitably into some peculiar temptation of sin for the powerful and successful. Namely, things like delusions of being like God. Delusions that we are omnipotent. Or that we have this pride in what we can do on our own. Such a state of, uh, such a mindset will inevitably allow us to attempt to do the things that only God can do. We try to control everything to exert our power against the things that are creeping up against us. We at attempt to wrap every stone of life in the life of its citizens. Now before we, we visit these ancient empires that we're talking about from before, let's start with our situation here in this country. And that may be a little strange, maybe you think we start with the story and get to our country later, but I want to start this morning with our nation. Our nation is a lot like what you're going to hear, and that's regardless of where your politics may lie. Now, if America, if we were as a nation to go to the doctor for some kind of a checkup, I imagine the doctor would say that we have stage 4 bone cancer. And the, the, uh, the things that he is seeing, the effects of this disease, is our moral relativism. The fact that we self-worship, our, we worship ourselves in idolatry. And we, frankly, go about doing everything we can to go against what God has called us to. We have seen in this country a drastic shift towards calling the things that are good evil and the things that are evil good. We've become a people who call the murder of preborn infants a human right. We see people who laugh and encourage young children, to get to young boys in particular, to, to, uh, to dance about and pretend to play the game of, of being a girl and vice versa. And not only do we encourage it, there are instances where we see it being celebrated as well in our society. And there are many other symptoms that I could acknowledge this morning that point to you, but the reality is, is that when I talk to many of you, you already see many of these things that I would reference going on in our country. Someone I listened to on the radio yesterday said, it's so blatant that it's not even hidden anymore. It's just out there. Now we claim as a people in this nation to believe in progress. Yet, there's not really much of a standard for which this progress is measured. Usually, 
and it can, this can happen in our own lives individually, it's nothing more than an excuse to continue down the path of whatever it is that we seek. We want to define our lives. We want to rule our lives. We even often, this is true of most of us in this world, we want to make ourselves like our God. We want to determine what is right and wrong. And yet what we find over and over again, the more we do this, the more we turn our existence into a hellish one. Now our nation continues, it's happening, been happening for quite some time, to continue to march to the beat of progress. And it's led often by individuals and groups who really don't know where they're headed. But they redouble their efforts in order to get there as soon as they can right away. We are seeing authorities, we've seen this a lot in this last year in particular, implementing rules and regulations that are hurting those who they're supposed to be serving. Not only that, we are seeing eternal biological truths being flipped on their heads and taught now as though they were somehow lies. Now none of this that I'm saying is out there in the future. It's not slippery slope talk. It's here now amongst us. And frankly, I know quite a few people that have gotten used to the conversation, the dialogue. Now, I, I looked up a quote, one of my favorite times in history to study about is World War II. And it's fitting maybe that I'm going to reference this on Memorial Day weekend. But there was a quote that one of the Nazi leaders said. He said, if you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. In fact, you want to know the reality is that in about 20 years, if things continue down the path that they're going, it'll just feel like it's the status quo that is normal behavior. That's, show, that's been proven throughout history that unless there's revival, the things that were aberrant before, before long, become normal. It's happened in every empire. We've fallen into a place of judgment in this nation. But I want you to know, and I hope that you want to know this, that you live, we all live with grace and hope and joy. God wants us to be fruitful and to flourish. Now, for the people of God, that's for those of us that are living in this empire, we've got two choices. You can be a kingdom people within the fallen kingdom, or you can be a kingdom people of God, the true God. So what do we do? This is a classic age-old question that Daniel addresses, Esther addresses, so many address. How are we to live... As the, as the world that we have maybe known, or the country that we maybe have known, we see this shift. There's always two basic wrong answers, and these are the things that people tend to gravitate towards. First, you might just say, you know what, I'm going to throw up my hands. It's what we would call nihilism. I, I, I'm just in complete and utter despair. There's nothing that I, as one person, can possibly do. There's no hope. Look at the power of the kingdom of darkness right now. Do you see the blood dripping on the hands of, of our people? Do you see the kingdom of darkness creeping over and taking over? It's being consumed and swallowed up. What in the world, what kind of world are we going to leave to our kids and our grandkids? This thing just can't last the way it's going. But despair doesn't work. It isn't fruitful. Despair is like a gelded colt. Despair is a field sown with salt. Despair won't move us any way, any direction worth going. So maybe instead of that, you give it the complete opposite pull. You just say, you know what? Everybody else is doing it. I better just assimilate and, and, and imitate what's going on in our world. If you can't beat them, join them, right? 
They'll just become against them. You know, it's, it's much easier to swim down, down current than it is to go against the current. Let's just let go of the things, the principles that we've lived on, and let's just give in to the things that we see going on in our world. But we know that what we, we become like the thing that we worship. In Psalm chapter 115, David wrote, Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. Those who make them become like them. So if you want to worship a deaf and dumb paperweight of an idol, you'll become a useless paperweight yourself. If you want to worship the gods of sex, money, power, and become just like them, you'll become greedy, you'll become power addicted, you'll be enslaved to your lusts, and you'll never be satisfied. So what I want you to hear before we finally dig into the story of Esther is neither of these methods that we tend to gravitate towards work. So the question might be, what do we do? How do we live in the time we are in? But here's some good news. We are not charting new paths in our struggle. It might feel like a new path, but this is an age-old question, an age-old struggle in every empire that's ever been here. We are not needing to be trailblazers, but what we do need to be is to be people of the book, to people of history, to understand where empires and believers even have come before us to learn how we ought to exist and live in the midst of something evil and at times can maybe even feel to you personally that it's omnipotent. It's how do I get out from underneath everything that's going on? So turn with me to Esther chapter 1. I'm going to read the first nine verses. And it's up on the screen here as well if you would like to follow along there. Now in the days of Ahuseris, the Ahuseris who reigned from India to Ethiopia, over 127 provinces, in those days when King Ahuseris sat on his royal throne in Susa, the citadel, in the third year of his reign, he gave a feast for all of his officials and servants. The army of Persia and Media and the nobles and governors of the provinces were before him. While he showed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor and pomp of his greatness for many days, 180 days. And when those days were completed, the king gave all the people present in Susa, the citadel, both great and small, a feast lasting for seven more days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. There were white cotton curtains and violet hanging fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rods and marble pillars, and also couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and precious stones. Drinks were served in golden vessels, the vessels of different kinds, and the royal wine was lavished according to the bounty of the king. And the drinking was according to, his, to this edict. There is no compulsion. For the king had given orders to all the staff of his palace to do as each man desired. Queen Vashti also gave a feast for the women in the palace that belonged to King Ahuseris. So in chapter 1, right off the bat, we meet Ahuseris, king of Persia. Now he's better known throughout history as Xerxes, that's his Greek name. Ahuseris was the son of Darius. And we read about his actions during the captivity um, in the story of Ezra and in other books. Now, around the 5th century B.C., Israel, as we recall from these last two Sundays, they were at the tail end of their exile in Syria, or I'm sorry, in Persia. Under Darius, as we talked about last week, they had been given permission to return back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, and the walls. This subgroup of, of Jewish people went back to, uh, to preserve their culture and their worship 
of the one true God. Now, in these first nine verses, I imagine one of the things that stood out to you is what I find to be the overriding uh, impression that, that uh, the author is trying to instill in us. And that's a sense of awe and extravagance about what this man, Ahuzeres, had at his disposal. We're supposed to be in awe of power, the wealth, and frankly, the waste that was exhibited. Now, in these days where we can go to any store, in fact, this came up in, in uh, Sunday school this morning about walking into a grocery store and seeing the abundance of food that we have, it might be a little bit difficult to understand truly how huge of a feast this was. We can just go, you know, if you want to go grab something to eat, you just go down to a grocery store or to a, a restaurant and grab some food. And it's available 24-7. But it's inconceivable, almost, how much food would have been used for this feast. It says that the laborers barely earned enough to feed themselves by the end of the day's work. They went to a party that lasted 180 days. So what's all of this extravagance about? Why does the story start with this? It's supposed to show that Ahuzeris is is representing or deifying himself as God of the throne. Now history tells us that this throne that he sat on was situated on top of what is called a, a necropolis. It's a heavily fortified place, and it was situated about 120 feet up in the air. So what is this message trying to send? Because we know when it comes to power and authority, Oftentimes it's the things we see that's, that's done intentionally. It's to portray some message. And it says this, My throne is high and exalted, looking down on the mortals I rule. Ahuzeris is saying, with his every move and every word, I am God. Worship accordingly. Every detail in this party is designed to underscore his rule to be godlike. Notice that Ahuzeris is so concerned with his power that he even had a law posted to tell people not to be compelled how much they drank. Be free, do as drink as much as you want, he says, but the subtext here is clear. Beware. Even the fun that you have here is regulated by my word. What we're being introduced here to start is a counterfeit God. Now let's read the next two verses, verses 10 and 11. On the seventh day of that, fe of that feast, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who served in the pres presence of King Ahuzeris to bring Queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown in order to show the peoples and the princes her beauty. For she was lovely to look at. So now he takes this to the next level. He flaunts his power to his servants. He says, go and fetch my beautiful wife so that they can see what a man I am. To people who aren't, can't even be called men anymore because they were castrated servants. And so this idol, this king, gleams from, the, from the, the throne. His power, his word is unavoidable. You have a tyrant, in a sense, ruling. What's going to come next? Well, let's look at verse 12. Remember, by the way, we talked about this with Nehemiah, how Nehemiah comes before the king in great humility. And if you know the story of Esther well, you know that when she stands before the king, or comes before the king, she does so in great fear for her life. Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command. This is verse 12, delivered by the eunuchs. And as a result, the king became enraged, and his anger burned within him. So what just happened would be the equivalent of a drama being turned into a satire. 
One of the things Esther turns out to be this book is a divinely authored satire unfolding in our lives. It's the true God mocking a fake one. Now, does my saying that surprise you? Because it shouldn't. Go back to Psalm chapter 2. He says, why, God says, why do nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the throne laughs. He holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them with his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. So we as people think we have all of this power and ability to do what we have because of the things that we feel we've accomplished or because of our position or our, our finances. And God, in a sense, says, you don't know anything about power. Now here, King Ahuzeris, who again was conqueror of the worlds, he was the swallower of cities, he was the ruler of what was at the time seemingly an unbreakable kingdom. When he put out his word, his laws were decreed. Enemies were put to death, and his friends were fabulously rewarded. His word goes out, and lo, it does not return void. What he says happens. But wait, we have irony in verse 12. He sent out his word, and his wife won't even listen to him. Do you see what God's doing here? Here's a man who can command armies, he can rule provinces, but he doesn't have authority over his wife. The man who commands nations can't command a single woman. There are cracks running spiderweb throughout his kingdom. Now what should happen at this point? If you were Ahuzeris, and, and what, what should you realize? Well, he should realize that the things that he's been pursuing, these fake gods, they aren't gods at all. This could be seen as an opportunity, a moment of God's grace, that, hey, hang on a second here, I don't have absolute authority. This could be the moment where he could step back and say, you know what? Maybe I'm not the God that I think I am. Maybe I need to realize that I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not everything. That's one of the things God does with each of us. He willingly lets us out into the open. He gives us the space to, 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 to see where our lives go. But then he always provides those opportunities of grace at those limit points. Now, whether we choose to listen is another story. But we need to realize, in whatever form it takes in our own lives, we are not gods. Now my assumption is, and you can tell me after the service if this is a wrong assumption, but my assumption is that no one in here has probably sat down someday and said, oh, you know, I'm God. I am God. But we do so by the way we live our lives. It isn't by what we speak, it's by what we do and what we what we reveal that we truly believe. So when you run into those instances where you think, you know what, I can't do this, or I have reached my limit. I can't, I can't deal with my child right now because I've reached my limit with them. Or I can't deal with what's going on at my job right now because I've reached my limit. Or I'm stressed out and I don't know what to do. We see the negative in that, but sometimes those limits are designed as ways to help us realize we are not gods of our own lives. It's actually an act of grace. It is grace for God to refuse us success in our idolatry. Now in this moment, we have this decision all the time, but Ahuzeris had two choices. He could repent or he could live in arrogance. So let's see what he did. 
Okay, last part of the story for today. The king said to the wise men who knew the times, for this was the king's procedure towards all who were versed in law and judgment. The men next to him being Karshina, Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Miriz, Marcina, and Mamukin, the seven princes of Persia and Medea, who saw the king's face and sat first in the kingdom. According to the law, what is to be done to Queen Vashti? Because she has not performed the command of King Ahuzeres, delivered by the eunuchs. Then Mamukin said in the presence of the king and the officials, Not only against the king has Queen Vashti done wrong, but also against all the officials and all the people who are in the provinces of King Ahuzeres. For the queen's behavior will be made known to all women, causing them to look at their husbands with contempt, since they will say, King Ahuzeres commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, and she did not come. This very day, the noble women of Persia and Medea who have heard of the queen's behavior will say the same to all the king's officials, and there will be contempt and wrath in plenty. If it pleases the king, let a royal order go out from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, so that it may not be repealed. That Vashti is never again to come before the king, and let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. So when the decree made by the king is proclaimed throughout all his kingdom, for it is vast, all women will give honor to their husbands, high and low alike. This advice pleased the king and the princes, and the king did as Mamukin proposed. He sent letters to all the royal provinces, to every province in its own script, and to every people in its own language, that every man must be master in his own household and speak according to the language of his people. Now, a quick aside, again, there's a lot going on in there. We'll get to the meat of it here in a second. But very quickly, I think it's important to acknowledge, as a side note here, this is not intended to be a teaching mechanism, men, that we say, oh, look at what we are to do with you women. Okay? The authority in God's kingdom isn't what's being portrayed here. So don't allow someone to use this text as, see, see, don't, that's not what this is about. But there's something important going on here because what we see in this empire, we see going on in our empire here or in this country, in the U.S. And what I mean by that is our culture is in high, what I'll call high rebellion against God. We have created in this culture where we use women as sexual gratification more than anything else. I think about, again, something else that was mentioned in Sunday school about how almost impossible it is for us, but I think about my kids and those that are in that age category, about how difficult it is to remove themselves from, particularly those boys, from the images that are portrayed by companies, on the web, all over the place. You can't hardly get away from it now. There's so much exposure. And then not only is that how men often have treated women in our society, they refuse to take responsibility in many cases to actually nourish and cherish her. We don't even know what the word covenant really means anymore when it comes to marriage. Not even in the church. Look at the divorce rates that are taking place. And that, you know what? As a parent, if I, if I fathered a kid... And I don't want to deal with them, I'll just move on. That's what's become the norm in many cases in our culture. Or, as I said earlier, we just say, you know, we don't even want to have the kid. Let's just get rid of the kid before it's born. This is an example of what it looks like for a culture that doesn't respect women. But the crazy thing, again, about all this is Ahuzeris to us is doing exactly the thing that's contrary to God's teaching. Men and women are the image bearers of God. Do you realize that? You are all, from birth, you are image bearers of the living God. We are not gods. Women are not our vassal slaves. 
We are to be in union, in partnership. Now back to the story. Uh, Huzairus refuses the invitation of grace. Again, there was the opportunity for him to step back and say, you know what, I've been wrong about a few things, maybe a lot of things, let's clear this up and like, let's make amends. But no, he doubles down, thanks to the wise advice of his colleagues there, his buddies, that no, we need to just ramp this up a little bit more. He punishes where he ought to repent. And then, and this is the part that's kind of laughable about it, is he passes a law so that wives will have to honor their, their, uh, their husbands. Now, do you see the irony here? He couldn't even get one single woman to listen to him. Now, I heard it said once that some legislators out in California passed a law requiring that it would rain twice a week so that the drought would end. Now, fake gods can decree decrees, but their word will come back void in the end. And so the story of Esther begins, though we haven't even met her yet. Maybe you expected me to preach on the part about where she talks, you know, where, she, where she's told that now is the time that you were made, you, know, you were made for such a time as this. That's the passage that everybody wants to refer to. We haven't even gotten to Esther yet. So how long do you have today? <laughs> oh. But we already see the idolatry and the folly that happens through Persia. But there's something curious I referenced very quickly, and I imagine it's a factoid that pastors in the past have probably said to you too when they've preached out of Esther, and that it's the only book in the Bible that never mentions God directly. It doesn't ever mention his name. Now, over the course of the centuries, it's caused people to dispute whether or not this book should even be included in the canon. So the question is, is God absent in the book? I mean, I've only done 22 verses of this book, but absolutely not. If you read through this book, or as you've read through it this time, we can see quite clearly what God would call us to do. He's relentlessly inviting us to compare two kings and their two kingdoms. So before we leave this morning, let's take that invitation. Let's take a look at the two kings and two words of application. So this is where the rubber meets the road for us today. As you read through the Bible, and as you study history, it's always a study of, or a story of, of struggle between kings, authority, whoever, you know, dictators, whatever terminology you wish to use in 2021. But all the way back from Edom, to Assyria, to Babylon, to Persia, to Rome, the true, even to the true king, we have all of these rivals who are trying to, up, to up, unseat him. And that's the story we've really been reading that's beneath the surface. You've got a choice in who's going to be king in your life. In this story, was, is, it, is it King Jesus? Is he the king or is it King Ahuzeris? How do we compare these two? Well, what did Ahuzeris do? He enslaved people. He extorted them. He degraded them and he shamed them. But in Christ's kingdom, he frees us, he enriches us, he cleanses us, and he exalts us. It is what the Bible calls pure religion, and it is glorious. Where Ahuzeris throws a party in a desperate attempt to win respect and glory, Jesus sets a table, a wedding feast, for those whose worship he has always rightly secured. Where Ahuzeris abuses and uses and strips and degrades his wife, Christ washes, clothes, cleanses, adorns, and cherishes his bride. Ahuzeris' bride is reduced to an object and is jeered at, someone that he brings forward for the amusement and pleasure of his buddies. Jesus' bride is brought forth in smiling splendor, her dignity clothed, and in resurrected glory. Jesus gives no shame, but he rather he takes it from us and removes it by the blood of the cross. He shows us a new way to be a man. We are no longer to be grasping 
for stolen respect or for blinding glory. Ahuzeris' words, as we read it, I hope you hear, his words just are kind of silly that he's doing this. He's doing everything he can. He's grasping at straws to try to maintain his, uh, his leadership, his power. He's got to look probably pretty ridiculous before these other officials that are there. But it returns void. But God's word goes out in true power, and not one syllable returns without accomplishing its intent. So God's kingdom and the king of our world, whomever that may be at the time, are standing in opposition. There's only one God who's truly worthy of worship. Ahuzeris is the name that we see in this book, but there are many imitations that have come since then. In this book where God isn't named, God is nonetheless compare, inviting us to compare him to his rivals, to see who is it that is worth worshiping and glorifying. So we must repent of all of our misplaced worship and fear and live with confident joy because there is a better kingdom before us. So here are our two words of application. They are simply this, and they're the words I mentioned earlier. Don't despair and don't assimilate. Remember those two wrong answers to the question. How are we to live um, as the people of God amidst the empires of fallen men? You might despair because we look around and think, man, look at the power. How, what can I do? They look so durable. It looks insurmountable. But listen, don't despair. Don't shake too much before the powers of this world because God is laughing at them. Fake gods want to do everything they can to get you to conform to their decrees, to worship at their feet. And we must say no, not because we're stronger, but because we serve the God of the heavens. What hope do we as a people of God have when someone incompetent tries to sit in the place of the heavens? And Esther teaches us, we must wait and hope for the Lord to move. His wisdom is unrivaled. His power is limitless. So stop looking at what's going on in our nations on the surface as only the physical and understand that there is a spiritual battle we face. We must not also assimilate or imitate. And I'm convinced that that truly is the great temptation. That we slowly, just gradually conform to the patterns of this world. Why do you think in Romans chapter 12, Paul addressed that very directly? He said, Do not be, or I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, to prevent your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, so that you may test through your discernment what the will of God is, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. Brothers and sisters, we are not our own. We belong to God. He has purchased us by his own perfect blood. And we are now a city in a city. We are in a kingdom that is within kingdoms. We are a possession of him, not of the peoples. So don't assimilate. Do you just have information come into you without discerning? Do you listen to what's being presented to you in your daily life or even on a Sunday morning? Do you take it in without critiquing it and asking yourself, is this truth? Because I guarantee, especially you young people, you have so much information that's being bombarded in your lives. So much that it almost seems, because you can't discern it all. But you've got to use the grid of scripture and when you're not sure, go talk to someone. Find someone else and ask them. Say, what, you know, this is what I'm seeing. This is what I'm experiencing. Do we go to the cisterns of this world for fulfillment? Or do we find our fulfillment in the waters that Jesus offered so that we will never thirst again? No, we must pray, your kingdom come, 
your will be done on earth as in heaven. And so what you've all hopefully been waiting for is how do we act? I've said what not to do. How are we to live? And I would say do this. Begin here. We live by faith that our better, in our better king and his indestructible kingdom. We stand as citizens in his kingdom. While we are here, we are called to occupy. We are not to run away. We are not to just go with the flow. We are here to occupy and grow the kingdom. And so we remind ourselves, we, don't, we are not called here to build First Baptist Bunker. We're here to, call, to build First Baptist Church and other churches. So we are, be a church builder, be a kingdom builder first, so that those around us that don't know Christ can hear the trueness of Christ. Because as was, I said earlier this morning, it's in the dark world that we live in where the light will shine the brightest. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, there is so many things that are going on in our world. And as, as I said a minute ago, there is information overload, overload Lord. And we, we've also become a society where it's, uh, it's very difficult for us to sit and consume information. We are looking for a quick answer. Even when it comes to the word, Lord, help us to be diligent and discerning and uh, focused on our study so that we may not be looking just for a simple, quick answer because you told us to hide your word in our heart and we will never be able to truly hide it in our heart unless we devote ourselves to you. Lord, teach us to, uh, to be discerners of those instances and areas of our life where we continue to hold on to some sense of authority. Lord, we know that we are all living in some defiance of you just because of the nature of sin in our world. Lord, but help us to root those things out, whether it be through prayer, whether it be through your word, or whether it be through the, the wisdom of another brother or sister. Lord, teach us to be uh, people of humility so that we may continue to grow closer to you. Uh, we may become more like you, transformed through the renewal of our minds, uh, and so that in our deeds we may make, may make you known through all of the world. In your name we pray. Amen. Please stand for the benediction in our closing song. So finally, brothers and sisters in Christ, aim for restoration. Make sure to comfort one another. To live in peace. And to, and to worship the God of love and the God of peace who will be with you wherever you go. Remember, church, we are sent.